Islam, I end it by saying this. Allah talks about people, when their death comes, they say the following words. He, the criminal, the person who has neglected their life, when the time of death comes, they actually know that they're dying. And when the soul is coming out and reaches the godling point, I'll tell you about the thought process. You know what they're thinking? They're saying, Oh, our Lord, please return me. Maybe I will compensate, do some good work instead of what I have left behind. But Allah replies by saying, But Allah will not postpone the time of a person when their death comes. In another ayah he says, it will not be postponed, postponed, nor brought forward a single moment. My brothers and sisters in Islam, live the life with the advice of the Prophet ﷺ, which he said to Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, or was it Abu Dhar, or was it the man who came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, when will the world end? You know, you expected today a talk about the signs of the last hour. And when the Dajjal will come out and when the world will end. This is what the Sahabi said, Ya Rasulullah, Mata Sa'a, when will the world end? Tell me, tell me, entertain me, like a movie. For Rasul Sallallahu knew that this person was asking the wrong question, he was after the wrong purpose. So he responded with a question. What have you prepared for it? He's saying, What have you prepared for your sa'a, for your time when your world will end? My brothers and sisters in Islam. Prepare for your time and prepare from now. And do not look at the insignificant issues in life. There's something out there that says uh, life is like, or Iman is like uh, going into an aeroplane. I think that's what it says up there. I like that metaphor. The higher the aeroplane goes, the smaller the world looks. And Iman is like that. The higher your Iman rises, the smaller this worldly stuff, you know, these things you get upset about, these things you get annoyed about. The, the smaller they look. A brother said to me the other day, he says, I went and did this and did that for this sick person. Wallahi, never again will I do it. I said, why, why are you saying that? He says, it took out a lot from me. Never again. I said, don't say never again, ya akhi. Think about the rewards that you worked for and don't lose your rewards as Allah says. And do not lose your sadaqat, your acts of charity, bil manni wal adha. By saying words of man, meaning, look what I did, look what I did. I need praise, I need comfort. Well, other, and then saying words that hurt other people. I did this for you and I did that for you, expecting praise from others. Don't do that. Work and anticipate only the ajr from who? Who's the ajr from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not from people, my brothers and sisters. Not from people. I thank you for listening and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve all the destitute among us and those who are here and those who are around the world from their misery and from their hardships. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings and to make this gathering of ours one that unites our hearts with theirs. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve those who are in oppression from their oppression. Oh Allah, accept our dua. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our gathering in goodness. Ibrahim والسلام, the great prophet of Allah once asked the angel of death that you have taken the souls of millions of people has there ever been a time whilst taking the souls of these people have you ever felt remorse for anyone have you ever felt pity on anyone so the angel of death says yes I remember one time that a woman a pregnant woman was traveling by a ship and while she was giving birth at that time Allah ordered me that you have to take her soul so when I went to take her soul I took out her soul she gave birth to this beautiful baby boy and I extracted her soul at that time after she delivered this boy, baby boy and I asked Allah that oh Allah what about this boy the ship is now sinking. The ship began to sink because of the weather. It's stormy night. The ship is sinking. She's given birth to this beautiful baby boy. Oh Allah, I've taken the soul of the mother. What do you want me to do with this boy? Allah says, 
that take a plank from the wreckage, put him on there safely, and then I will look after him. So the angel of death wounded to himself. He says to Ibrahim wasalam, that I kept wondering that how is this baby going to survive? But look at Allah. Look at the nizam, the system of Allah. That when he saves someone, look how he saves them. This baby is on this plank and it's a stormy night. He's being washed away. And Alhamdulillah, when he comes to the shore, there are people waiting there and people actually rescue this baby boy. This baby becomes, after a while, he becomes a young boy. Then he becomes a teenager. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endows him with power. Allah gives him knowledge. Allah even gives him a kingdom. He becomes a king. And he is known by the name of Shaddad. But this kingdom and this power got to his head. He became a disobedient of Allah. He violated the commandments of Allah to such an extent that he claimed that I am God. So one day he said to his people that worship me, do sajda in front of me. I am God, I am Allah. So they said to him, but Shaddad, look, you're a king, we respect you, we honor you, we cherish you, but that's about it. You know, God, you're going out of line here. So he says, well, what's the difference between me and God? They said to him, Shaddad, look, Allah is the being who gives life and death. Allah is the one who has created Jannah and Jahannam. So Shaddad says, so what? Life and death? I'll show you, I give life, I give death as well. So he told his gods that go and bring a group of people. You know, innocent people. People from the community. And this group of people are both before Shaddad. And then he makes two groups out of them. He says to his gods, kill the first group. So the first group goes, uh, the gods go and kill the first group. And then he says to the people, look, I give death. Then he says to his gods that go and kill the second group. So when the gods go to the second group and they are just about to kill them, Shaddad says, stop. Shaddad says to the people, look, I give life. Then they say to him, look, Shaddad, Allah has made a Jannah and Jahannam. Where's your Jannah and Jahannam? So this is the time that Shaddad started to build a Jannah on this earth. He gathered the best architects in the world at the time. The best builders at the time. The most expensive bricks, the most expensive equipment he could get his hands off. This man got it. And it took years. It took years. And these architects, these builders actually made something resembling a Jannah. They made such a beautiful garden. So many fruits in this garden. Beautiful women. Trees. Allahu Akbar. Such beautiful trees they made. That the flowers, when it, the wind would blow, from the flowers, the smell, the fragrance of uh, uh, musk and umber would emanate from these flowers. Such a beautiful Jannah. He made a Jannah on earth. Now come the day of the opening ceremony. Shaddad is the special guest. This is Jannah. He's eager to see his Jannah. And show the people that look I have made a Jannah as well. And he was challenging Allah. So he gets onto his horse. He's going to this Jannah on this opening ceremony. When he got to his Jannah. And when he was just about to come off his horse. He put one step off his horse. And one step, he took inside his Jannah. At that time, the angel of death was there waiting for him. One step inside, one step outside. The, he asks him, who are you? He says, I am the angel of death. And I have been ordered by Allah to take out your soul at this time, right now, at this minute. And the angel of death extracts his soul, takes his soul out. And then later, Allah informed the angel of death. That, oh angel of death. This is that same very boy who you saved. You took out his mother's soul, but you saved him. This is that same boy whose soul you have taken out today. My brother's death is in Allah's hands. Only Allah knows when you're going to die. Well, in one of the chapters of the Quran, this is a book of 6,626 verses, 114 chapters. 
that was revealed to a man called Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, who himself claimed to be a prophet of God, like Jesus, like Moses, like Abraham, like David, like Solomon. He claimed to be a prophet. And we believe, as Muslims, that he was a prophet. We believe that this Quran was, in fact, revealed to him. This is what our belief is. You don't have to believe that, but we do. In this book, among other things that I'm going to tell you about this book, there's a verse that says, أَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا says, Glory be to the one in whose hands, whose power there is all the dominion of the heavens and the earth that we, you and I cannot even imagine. It's established that there is a power there is a mind, there is an intelligence, there is an authority, there is a sovereignty behind this, what we call the creation. And that power and that sovereignty has all absolute power, not humans, not governments, individuals or collectively, past, present, future, nothing. We're just sophisticated sperm drops. That's all we are. Sophisticated, but that's where we started out, and in the end, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, that's all will be. It is that authority, that power, it is that mind, that intelligence that has created the heavens and the earth and everything in it and created death for the humans before giving them life. Think about that. Death was conferred upon us before we were even given life. It was already there. Inescapable. When you came into life, you carried with you the imprint on your DNA. You gotta die. That's a ticket that comes with the package. Life, death. But in this particular verse, we usually as humans say life, death, because we're living looking at death even though we ignore it but in this verse it switches it because the one who has given the life says death we give you as a gift life in order to see which one of you will be the best in their behavior and in their conduct or their responses now that verse gives us the premise of our discussion. That the purpose of life, this small little like that, that's all it is. We think of it as days, weeks, months, years. We call some of us, what do you call a person who's a um, hundred years old, we call them? A centenarian or something, what's that terminology? Somebody who's 80 years old, we give them different names, but it's just like that. And if you're 60 today, or in my case, 59 in three days. And maybe I shouldn't have said that, huh? <laughs> See, think back. Think back when you were 15 years old, 12 years old, when you were just playing around in the schoolyard at home, uh, doing this and that, you had no problems, and you're thinking about life and all the things you want to do and what you want to be and what you're going to achieve and your brothers and your sisters and your mother and your father and your house and no responsibilities, no rent, no bills, no nothing. Think about it. When was it? It was just yesterday. For me, it was just yesterday. Just like that. Where has the time went? What has happened? And now today, everyone will agree. It seems like the sun rises and sets and the day is just going like this. You can't even say, what, what happened? What was today? I said, today is Tuesday. So Tuesday, brother, this is Thursday. So what, what happened? It's time. Because time is nothing but a capsule. Time is nothing but a drop of water on the windowsill and the sun comes, it's gone. That's time. 
And that's what you and I have been given. We've been given time. And what you're going to do with this here time? You know, at the time of death, there was one brother, his whole life, what did he do? He was an alcoholic. He would drink day and night with his friends. When his time of death came, listen to this carefully. When the time of his death came, his family were all around him. And they were saying to him, Beta, recite La ilaha illallah. Say the kalima La ilaha illallah. And what is he saying? He is saying, give me a vodka, you have one also. At the time of his death. And with these words, he leaves his world. Another brother, hooked on to music, day and night, 50 cent, Snoop Dogg, in his car, you know, blasting this music, in his home, blasting this music, 24-7, nothing else to do. At the time of his death, my brothers, true incident, sad but true, Muslim, youngster, at the time of his death, family is saying, recite La ilaha illallah, and he is singing songs of 50 Cent and Snoop Dogg, and this is how he leaves this world. My brothers, you will die at your appointed time, but the choice is yours. If you lived a life of good, if you lived a life of obedience to Allah, if you were an obedient Muslim, you performed your salah, you didn't violate the commandments of Allah, then the messenger. More beautiful than him he has never seen in his own life. Dressed all in white. A beautiful fragrance, beautiful musk was emanating from his body. A fragrance that Ibrahim had never smelled before. Sayyidina Ibrahim said to the angel of death that if at the time of death there was no other joy, no other blessing for a good soul, then your appearance, this appearance that you have shown me would suffice, would be sufficient. Then Ibrahim requesting the O angel of death, show me the appearance that you undertake at the time of taking a bad soul. He says to him, O Ibrahim, you will not be able to bear it, you will not be able to see it. Ibrahim insisted, angel of death says to him, turn away, turn your face away. He turns his face away. The angel of death then tells him to look. When Ibrahim looked in front of him, what does he find? He finds a pitch black giant standing in front of him with long hair. All dressed in black. Pitch black giant standing in front of him. Rijlahu fil ard wa ra'suhu fil sama. His feet were on the earth and his head was in the sky. And an unbearable stench was emanating from his body. And fire was blazing out of his ears and from his nostrils. The hair on his body were like men. And fire was blazing out of the nostrils and out of the ears of these men. When Ibrahim sees this scene, he fainted. After some time when he became conscious, he said to the angel of death, that if at the time of death, there is no other punishment for a sinner, then seeing you in this state alone would be sufficient for him. This is the angel of death. If you were a good soul in this dunya, if you lived a life of obedience, if you corrected your lives, make a resolution today that inshallah, we will repent to Allah, we will correct our lives, we will come on to the way of deen inshallah. If you come on to the way of deen, 
and if you are a favorite of Allah, if you are a good soul, then at the time of death, my brothers, the angel of death will honor you. And as soon as he comes to this soul, what does he say? He says, Oh friend of Allah, Allah gives his salam to you. Allah. Allah gives his salam to you. Subhanallah. The Quran says, You are busy piling up, calculating, developing your careers, your money, your occupation, your wealth, until you visit the graves. Think about it. When was the last time that you went to a funeral? Was it your mother? Was it your father? Was it your grandfather? Was it your uncle? Was it your cousin? Was it your friend? Was it your wife? Was it your husband? The last time that you visited the grave, when you went to a funeral and you saw that person whom you loved that was laughing, crying, live, boasting, wealthy, educated, denying, arrogant, whatever they were. What was the demeanor of the people when you walked in that funeral home, when that person was stretched out in their last suit? What was the demeanor? Were the people cracking jokes? Were they dancing? Were they clapping and singing songs? No. Silence. Melancholy. Trauma. Why? Because every person that walked in that room, seeing that person stretched out, the first thing they thought about was not the person. The first thing they thought about was that one day, this will be me. And then after you go to the funeral house, if you got the guts, if you're able to do so, you go to the grave. And now this is another scenario. And you say to yourself, is that it? I mean, 50, 60 years, scraping, struggling, scheming, lying, stealing, fornicating, jumping up and down, begging, working, and this is the end of it? I mean, is this what's going to happen to me? Are they going to be dropping me into a, a hole in the ground? A hole in the ground, the same hole that a cat digs after it defecates. Just a little deeper. But for the same reason, the cat digs a hole because the cat has dignity, something that human beings don't seem to have. Instinctively, the cat digs a little hole, covers it up. <laughs> Humans have got to be taught to do that, but it's for the same reason. So you and I, we're going into a hole a little deeper than the one the cat dug. And all the people that's crying, pulling out their hair, screaming, almost acting like they're falling in the thing with you. They want to just jump in there with you. Not really though, you know, it's all a, it's all an act. Because ain't nobody really going to jump in there and stay in there. They don't love you that much. <laughs> and then after all the shoveling, after all the shoveling get done, and they fill it up, and the, the box, you can't even see the box no more, the coffin. The coffin that costs 5000 I don't know, what they, what they, what did they burn somebody in a $5,000 coffin for? I mean, if I was the funeral director, after they left, I would dig them back up and put them in another box and take that box back. <laughs> and, and honestly, I'm telling you, that's what they do. <laughs> yeah. So after all the money and all the drama, and they dig that hole and put you in there and cover you up, so it really means that after all this time and the people walk away from that grave, it's over. What about that person in the grave? What's happening?
Because you know and I know that death is almost like sleeping. Death is like sleeping. Your body is gone. Your body is dead. Your spirit is gone. But your consciousness is there. Yes, brothers and sisters, you and I are going to know when the people put us in that box and put us in the grave, we are going to know. Your spirit is gone. You can't shout. You can't call out. You can't say, don't leave me here. But you're going to be hearing and you're going to be seeing because that's a different kind of consciousness. But you can't move. And in that grave, this is when the real trauma is going to begin. Because there's a reason for humans to go inside the grave. If the Creator wanted to, He could have caused us to live and then disappear into the, into the atmosphere. But He didn't. He caused us to go into another womb called the tomb. You started out in the womb of your mother and you wind up in the womb of the earth called the tomb. From the womb to the tomb. This is the whole trip. My young friend, do not be deceived by that BMW that you may drive. Do not be deceived by that Jaguar or the fat Range Rover that you may have. Do not be deceived by the bungalows that you may live in. Tall, lofty buildings, beautiful houses, the beautiful clothes that you may wear. Do not be deceived by this dunya. Why? وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاءُ الْغُرُورُ This dunya is deceiving. Why? Because everything with this dunya will come to an end and this dunya will also come to an end. كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ There is only one thing to remain and that is none other than the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi, the creator of the dunya. Other than this, every single thing will perish. Say, O Muhammad, قل, tell these people, إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْ فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ You know this, dead, this death that you're running away from? And you and I at this moment in time are running away from death. We really don't believe it. You know, we might not say with our mouth that we don't believe in death, we may acknowledge it, yeah, because we've seen people go before us. So we may say we believe, but our actions are a proof that we don't believe. You see the massage is full on a Friday. You see the massage is full today. You'll see the massage is full on the day of Eid. But the rest of the year, my young friend, tomorrow come Fajr Salah, you will see one or two stuffs inside this masjid. And the same goes around for every other masjid in this country. When it's time for Salah, we become deaf and blind to the teachings of Allah and His Rasul. When it's time for Zakah, we become deaf and blind to the teachings of Allah and His Rasul. When it's time for Hajj, we become deaf and blind to the teachings of Allah and His Rasul. Our A'mal are saying that we don't believe in death. We're running away from death. Allah is saying, you tell them, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you can run wherever you like. You can go in the depths of the Atlantic, in the total darkness. My friend, you can climb the peak of the Everest. My friend, you can hide in the darkness of the Amazon or the Kalahari bush. When your time comes to an end, wherever you are, walu kuntum fi burujim They say the Pentagon and Fort Knox are places where no one can penetrate and get through. You can go and hide there. When your time comes to an end, all of a sudden, the barrier will be removed from your eyes. You're in the dunya, but now you can see the akhirah and you will see that angel standing before you wherever you are in any corner of the globe. You cannot escape. You could be Bill Gates and you can possess billion and billions of dollars. My friend, you can take the virgin spaceship and go to space. You can try what you like. When your time comes to an end, believe or not believe, you will see the angel 
standing before you. He will get you. Then, ثُمَّ تُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ آلِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ ثُمَّ تُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ آلِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ Every one of us, we will return to the knower of the seen and the unseen. appointed time every single person has been given an appointed time a fixed term they will stay in this dunya when your time comes at that time not a minute earlier not a minute later exactly at that time the angel of death will be there to take your soul only Allah knows when you're gonna die nobody besides Allah you know, just recently we had that, we had that thing going around 12, 12, 12. You know, unfortunately, many Muslims also fell into the trap about the significance of 12, 12, 12. So this must have got into the head of one person, literally got into his head. You know, a man by the name of Krishna Pal, this is a true incident I'm telling you, I'm not making it up. Krishna Pal, from India, north of India, Uttar Pradesh. So he decided that he is going to challenge Allah. And he has decided that he is going to die on the 12th of, uh, of the 12th month, December, at 12 noon exactly. So what does he do? He writes a 12 page note. And in that note, he explained his reason. He said, who is Allah? Who is God? You know, to determine when I will die. I will die with my own choice. I will die when I want to die. Who is Allah? And then he decided to die exactly at this time, 12th of December at 12 noon. He wrote this note. And what he did was, is you know back home we have, right on the top of the houses we have water tanks. So he made his preparation from early morning. He got bricks and stones and sticks ready. And he went up onto the water tank and he put them there safely. And then he took the 12 page note with him and he climbed on top of this water tank. Now the people who saw him, you know, the whole town got together, the whole village got together. The police found out that came to the scene also. And they asked him, you know, why are you doing this thing? So he sent, you know, the 12 page note, he threw it down. And in there he clearly said that I want to die at the time I want to die, at the time I determine, not Allah. I'm living my own life. Who is God to determine when I die? You know, I live my life with my choice. I do what I want to do in life. Who is Allah? Who is God? And I want to die at this time. So the people were pressurizing him to come down. So some people actually tried to go up to the water tank to save this person. And what you would do, you would start beating them with sticks and you start throwing bricks and stones at them so they wouldn't get anywhere near it. Exactly, he planned to die 12, 12, 12, 12th of December, 12 noon at that time. But look what Allah planned. The police are pressurizing him. The local people, the community, they're pressurizing him. And he fell into the pressure. And instead of 12 noon, he jumped from there at 11 a.m. And he jumped 80 feet and he was finished. He died. So my brothers, only Allah knows when you're going to die. You can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You can make whatever plans you want to make. But only Allah knows when you're going to die. And you will die at that time no matter what happens. And no matter what you do. At the time of Suleiman alayhi salatu was salam, there was a man. And he was sitting in the court of Suleiman alayhi salatu was salam. Another man came in. Another man came in. And this man was none other than the angel of death in human form. So the angel of death came into the court of Suleiman alayhi salatu was salam. And he started staring and continuously gazing at this young man sitting next to Suleiman alayhi salatu was salam. Now obviously if somebody is gazing at you and continuously staring at you, you're going to be scared. You're going to think, what the hell is this guy's problem? And this is what he was thinking. He was absolutely frightened to death. 
this guy. So, after a little while, the angel of death left. And this young man asked Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam that, who was that guy? You know, he was looking at me, you know, like he's never seen another human in his life. He's staring at me. Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam informed him that that was the angel of death. This person becomes more frightened for his life. He says, oh Sulaiman, he was the way he was looking at me, he is definitely thinking about taking my soul. So, oh Sulaiman, you do Sumer. Sulaiman says to him, well, what do you want me to do? You know, if your time's come, your time's come, what can I do about it? So he says to him, oh Sulaiman, you have power over the winds. Order these winds to take me to India. Now look where Sulaiman is. And look where India is. Look how far it is. You know, Jerusalem is sitting there. And he's ordering him, take me to India. So Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam, he did a favor upon him. He ordered the winds and the winds carry this man to India. As soon as he lands in India, what does he find? The angel of death is there in front of him. And he takes out his sword. At a later time when the angel of death came to Sulaiman alayhi salatu wasalam, Sulaiman asked him that, you know, why were you continuously gazing at this man? Why were you standing him down? So the angel of death said that, you know, Allah ordered me to take his soul. And when I came to your call, I was wondering that Allah ordered me to take his soul in India and he's sitting here next to you. How is he going to get to India? How is he going to get to India? Why is he sitting with you? But this man voluntarily made his way to India and I was there waiting to take out his soul. Allah. Allah knows where you will die, my friend. Only Allah knows. Say to them, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that this death that you flee from will grab you. This death that you run away from, this death that you flee from, you try to escape from, فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ It will grab you. And then you will return to Allah, the knower of the unseen and the seen, and He will then inform you what you got up to in the dunya.